Welcome to another edition of Limbrook TV's A Few Minutes of Limbrook History. I'm Art Matson, Limbrook Village Historian. Upcoming, you will hear about how Limbrook in World War I supported the troops 100 years ago, in the years 1917 and 1918. I'll be talking a lot about this monument that stands behind me the Limbrook Doughboy. The Limbrook TV crew asked me to come down here before my program to have you get a feeling, a live feeling, for what this place looks like. The monument was dedicated and erected in 1921, three years after the conclusion of World War I. The setting here is lovely, as you can see, with the shrubbery, other monuments dedicated to the men and perhaps women, I think all men as it happens, who fought and died in various wars, Vietnam, World War I, Korean War. It's just an absolutely lovely place. And for that reason, it received national recognition as among the absolutely nicest settings for a World War I monument, one of the 50 nicest in the United States. On the front of the monument, it says, lest we forget to the memory of our boys of Limbrook and vicinity who made the supreme sacrifice in the 1917 World War, 1919. Of course, back then they called it the World War, not realizing that this was just the first of two World Wars. There are a total of 15 names on the monument, and I'd like to read those names, and I will be discussing each one of them a little bit later in this program. On this side, we have Lieutenant Philip H. Farron, Sergeant Harold M. M. Lathrop. His name is on the post, the VFW post of Lindbrook. Sergeant Freddie Wanders, Corporal Robert F. Garrison, the East Rockaway VFW post is named after Corporal Garrison. We have a cook, Frank B. Howard. I'll have a special story to tell about the bravery, the incredible bravery of that man. Private George Dahlbender. Uh, Private Clarence A. Ferris. Let's walk around to the other side. Here we have Corporal Frank S. Wedlick. Private William A. Goble, Private Vincent Higgins, Private Wilfred J. Jackson, Private Anthony Ray, Private William A. Smith, Private, Private Chauncey B. Sulphur, I have an interesting story about him, Private Sylvester Lamantia. Now, referring back to the front of the monument, lest we forget is the first line You'll hear more about that phrase a little bit later in this show. You see, three more boys from Limbrook died in World War I, and the names have only come to light this year. Those names are not on the monument. You'll also hear some interesting stories about, for example, the women of Limbrook, who reacted so positively in support of the troops, both here and abroad, especially one great hero, Rusha Williams, a World War I nurse. You'll also hear about a dog, a Scottish retriever named Caesar, who was a World War I hero. You'll hear why he was buried with honors in Limbrook at the end of the war. So thank you very much for tuning into the show. I hope you'll stay tuned for the rest. I think you'll enjoy it. Okay, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Madeline Pearson. I'm the Executive Director of the Historical Society of East Rockaway and Lindbrook, and I'm very delighted to welcome you to one of our speaker programs. During the year, we do have about three speaker programs. We also have a fundraiser. We also do a local history program with our fourth graders. We have about seven schools from East Rockaway and Lindbrook, 10. This library we set up and we go through about five or six different aspects of Lindbrook and East Rockaway history and share that with the students because fourth grade 
grade is their time to learn about local history. So I want to introduce Art Matson. He's going to be our speaker tonight. He's also the Lindbrook Village historian, as well as a board of director member for the Historical Society. And we also have a special guest later you're going to meet, Tom um, Michio. Michio, and he was actually a former trustee and deputy mayor of East Rock, of Lindbrook, I'm sorry, Lindbrook. <laughs> And uh, he actually marched in the Veterans Day Parade um, this past Sunday in the city. So he's going to also tell you about his uniform a little bit. Okay, so I'll turn it over to Art. Thank you for joining us tonight. And Tom, why don't you just come up and make a cameo appearance so they can see what you'll be presenting a little bit later. About the middle of my, my presentation, in fact, just after that, Tom is going to be showing off his equipment and his World War I Doughboy uniform, and he looks just so spectacular, I had to just whet their appetite for when you're coming up in a bit. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Art. I uh, want to thank you and Marilyn Pearson for giving me the opportunity to, to present this tonight. It's, uh, it's, it's a great thing. Yeah, well, excited I'm excited to have you here. It'll be great. Thank you. It'll be a nice little break in my presentation to have you come back and describe all this wonderful gear you have. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Okay, so I want to thank the Historical Society, Madeline, for uh, letting me kick off their season of historical presentations here at the beautiful Limburg Public Library. And I also want to thank Alina mcgolan volk and her staff and, uh, for you know, the Limburg TV crew that's here that's going to bring this presentation into literally thousands of Limburg homes. Uh, so that'll be fantastic to see that. So I want to welcome you to the latest in my ongoing series that I've called A Few Minutes of Limbrick History. Now this, tonight, I'll tell you about the long forgotten, long forgotten story of heroism, sacrifice of the men and women of Lindbrook, East Rockaway, and Valley Stream in what was referred to as the, war, the World War, not World War I, they didn't know two was going to come, and it was also called the War to End All Wars, which sadly, as we know, it was not. Now, I'll be paying special attention to Limbrook, less to East Rockaway and Valley Stream, because after all, I am the official historian of the village of Limbrook. Whoop, there we go. World War is over. World War I ended almost exactly 100 years ago, on November 11th, 1911, at 11 a.m., that's easy to remember. The 11th month, the 11th day, the 11th hour of 1918. And this is Limbrook's Doughboy statue. It's a World War I Doughboy. Looks a lot like Tom. A little slimmer. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it was erected in 1921 to honor the 15 men from Limbrook and vicinity who died in that war. Now, World War I had an extraordinary impact on this village and surroundings, but especially on Limbrook, on everyday life here, an impact greater than that of any war after, not World War II, the Korean War, Vietnam, or any war since. Tonight, I'll try to put a literal face on the people that supported that war by telling you about some of the soldiers who died and fought, some of the men and women who served here at home and overseas. Now, I'm the author of this book, The History of Limbrook, and much of what I'm going to tell you tonight comes from research that I did on World War I, and I have a small segment in the book about it, but didn't have enough space to cover it the way I do tonight. You can find this book here at the Limburg Library. It's on the shelves. They have a few copies. And it's on Amazon.com. In the first part of my presentation, I want to give you an overview of World War I. And that's just in case when you were attending your high school history class, you may have forgotten some of the details. In July 1914, all hell broke loose in Europe. This is the colonial map of 1914. The great powers had divided up the entire globe. You can see very few areas are in white, China, a lot of Latin America. But other than that, divided up. 
Even the small powers, Denmark, Belgium, had taken huge chunks of land, Italy. Tensions mounted between these countries. Who was going to seize what from whom? As the United States had seized the Philippines just a short while before from the Spanish. So tensions mounted. The armies and navies grew exponentially. Conflict was almost inevitable. Any spark could set it off, and that spark came. The Archduke Ferdinand, he's sitting there holding the side of his head because it was an assassination in Serbia of a visiting dignitary. He and his wife were both killed. This, because of various treaties that one country had with another, progressively countries were drawn into the battle. Now the following cartoon looks a little ridiculous, but it tells the sequence of events that ended up costing 16 million lives. So we see a poor Serbia here, that's where the assassination took place. It wasn't even a Serbian who did the assassination, it was a Bosnian. And Austria then, because it was the Archduke Ferdinand, the heir to the throne of the Austrian Empire, was killed. They attacked Serbia. R Russia had an agreement with Serbia if they were attacked. So they attacked Austria, declared war. Germany had an agreement with Austria. They attacked Russia. Britain and F France and Britain had agreements with Russia. And so they declared war on Germany and Austria. And then later in the game, Italy came into, onto the scene. Now, in the first three years, America wisely stayed out of the fray. Meanwhile, the principal combatants slaughtered each other, literally by the million, in trench warfare in Europe, also in, in Russia as well. But finally, in 1917, America entered the war on the side of the British and the French. A bit later, I'll discuss the circumstances by which the U.S. entered the war. But their entry of the United States into the war was indeed decisive in ending the war. As Winston Churchill later put it, without America, the war would have ended with a German victory. But the cost to us was significant. It took 53,000 American combat deaths to accomplish their mission. It also took almost an equal number of Americans who died from the influenza of 1918, the flu. But our U.S. combat deaths pale in comparison to the staggering toll on our allies. You can see that the following slide, will, they'll show that, those deaths. Here are the statistics. Russia, a million seven, almost 2% of their population. France, a million 150, 4.4%. United Kingdom, 744,000 over 2%, and Italy, 460,000, 3.5%. There's the USA with 53,000, and again, double that number to allow for the flu, 0.05%. So it seems like a small amount that, that it cost us, but it's important to realize that all of this came very suddenly for us. We weren't in the war that long. And so look at this chart. It shows the deaths of United States servicemen by month. Look at that spike. Incredible. Almost all the deaths came in those three months. It was called the 100 Days Offensive. The war was won in those three months, thanks in part to the men from Limbrook, East Rockaway, and Valley Stream. Here are the first recruits from Limbrook. The photo was taken in 1917 by Limbrook's finest photographer, Leo Bach. They are the guys dressed in the black suits. Those are the recruits. Standing at attention is Limbrook's Pearsall Brigade, which I will talk about in a bit. Now, to, so you'll know where this photo takes place, can you see over here is a steam train. It's running along the railroad towards Valley Stream. And these stanchions are there along what is today called Stoughton and Avenue. And we would be standing right here where the library is, looking out towards the tracks, towards Atlantic Avenue, right over here. So that's where the photographer stood to take this. There was no Sunrise Highway at that time. So 15 soldiers died in the war from Limbrook, 
from combat, from the flu, and from accidents. So why, and this by the way was five times the rate for the rest of the United States. Five times the rate. So why were there so many deaths in Limbrook? Well, there are good reasons. They're among the first to be trained, they're among the best trained, and they were among the very earliest to volunteer and be recruited. And so they were assigned to the spear point of the Hundred Days Offensive to that attack, the decisive battle that ended the war. Now what you see here are British troops. So this is the summer of 1918 that this photograph was taken. Exhausted the British troops. Incredible what they had gone through at this point. They, and they were in grave, grave trouble. Their Russian allies had just backed out of the war. This is with the Russian Revolution, you know, in 1917, and they sued for peace. This meant, what you see here, the Germans were allowed, were then permitted to redeploy the troops from the Eastern Front to the Western Front. Hundreds of thousands of them were arriving through Germany, heading for France. And this photo shows some of those Germans. Then, when things looked at their worst, the American game changer arrived. Black Jack Pershing. By the summer of 1918, he had brought over a million American troops over to France, including the boys from Limbrook, East Rockaway, and Valley Stream. I want to show you the map of the front. This is the western front that extended from the channel up here in Belgium all the way along down to the Swiss border. And we're talking in a moment about the Siegfried line that is the final line of defense for the, for the Germans. It was a collaborative, collaborative effort of the Germans, of, of the, I'm sorry, of the Allies, uh, uh, the French and the English, with the English being more north, U.S. will attack here and the uh, French further down. The Americans broke through along with the French and the English and some Australian troops, and they broke through the supposedly impregnable Hindenburg line in the Hundred Days Offensive, a massive, massive attack almost along the entire front. The Her German high command, this man, General Erich Ludendorff, he saw his troops fleeing in all directions as the Allies were beginning to cross the German border. He, called, he radioed the Kaiser, We've lost, we must surrender, the war is over, we've lost. And it was great cost to the Americans because that concentrated attack, we had as many lost during that period of time as were lost at any other point by the Allies, but it was all concentrated right there. This is uh, the American dead at the Hindenburg line, just some of them. I have no knowledge that anybody from this area is in that picture, but uh, it's, uh, it is U.S. dead. So that concludes my overview of the war, uh, bringing back some of your memories from high school and maybe college, where you may have studied it. Um, part two, Limbrooks, East Rockaways, and Valley Streams dead in World War II. So, pardon? Well, I said two. Gee was I meant World War I. It's part two. <laughs> World War I. Thank you. In part two. Part two, I want to put names and faces to the people from Limerick, East Rockaway, and Valley Stream who participated in World War I, both overseas and at home. This is a newspaper from Southern Nassau called The Review. I think it was published in Freeport. 10th anniversary memorial issue of the Nassau Review from 1928. And it shows many of the World War I deaths from southern Nassau County. Of the first 11 photos you see there, the top 11, 10 of them are from Limbrook. The other is a nurse, she's right here, that's Helen Ficken from Hempstead. Now the quality of the microfilm is quite poor, but let's take a look at the guy at the top left, and then we'll look at three others. So we're going to focus on him first. Okay. 
This is Frank Howard, Frank B. Howard. He was a cook, and he was a hero. Frank was stationed hundreds of yards behind the line. He was not supposed to wield a gun unless the American lines were overrun by the Germans, and then he'd have to shoot. On September 26, 1918, the order came down that his fellow Long Islanders were about to be sent, quote, over the top, unquote, I mean, out of the fr trench and attack against the machine guns of the Germans. Frank Howard put aside his cooking utensils and asked to be allowed to join his buddies in the attack. The next day, September 27, 2018, Two boys from Limbrook and one from East Rockaway died in that attack. Cook Frank Howard was one of them. The other two were Corporal Robert F. Garrison and Sergeant Harold M. Lathrop. These last two heroes, you may know the names, have been because their names have lived on till today. Here we have the Howard Lathrop VFW post, number 2307 of Limbrook. And here we have Robert F. Garrison Post 3350 of East Rockaway. Now you might have noticed that Garrison's photo that we saw before, or you say right here rather, yeah, says he's from Limbrook. So the Doughboy Monument that has 15 folks from Limbrook and vicinity, most of these vicinity meant they had a Limbrook post office address. They were very close to Limbrook, but might have been in Valley Stream Municipality or in East Rockaway, just across the border. So we count them on, the, on our Doughboy statue. This gentleman is Chauncey Soper of Limbrook. Pretty poor quality photo. It's from that same newspaper. Now his family was one of the area's most respected families. In fact, I think his mom and dad were from, Valley, from, from Rockville Center. In uh, 1918, his draft number had not yet been called. At age 27, Chauncey and some of his buddies stole a car in Limbrook on impulse. It was a joyride, and he got caught. Judge New of Limbrook, N-E-U is his name, offered ha Chauncey a choice. Go to trial for grand theft or volunteer for the army. He volunteered, even though a felony conviction would have kept him out, by the way, but he volunteered. Well, the deadly flu e epidemic, I mentioned it before, of 1918, it killed more than half of the total U.S. troops that died. Worldwide, 50 million people died in the influenza of 1918. Chauncey Soper was one of them. He died in an army camp in New Jersey. So this is the Doughboy statue, 15 names from Limburg and vicinity inscribed on a Doughboy monument on the east and west side. And so here we see Harold Lathrop. We see Frank B. Howard, the cook. And there's Robert Garrison, okay? So th the three of the guys that I mentioned are, are, the, are there. Now the next slide I'm going to show you, I don't want you to be intimidated. Don't even try to understand everything on it and try to analyze it. Besides on TV, you won't even be able to see much of anything. It's a detailed compilation of many hours of my research. It has information Sorry. It has information on each one of the people on the monument and three of the men at the bottom down here that I'll talk about them as a group later. Uh, now five of the men live just outside the village of Limbrook and they are with this kind of a beige color I put there. So we have East Rockway, East Rockway, four from East Rockway, one from Valley Stream. All those with white are from Limbrook to help you with that. Um, so those guys from East Rockaway, Corporal William Garrison, Wilfred, Private Wilfred Jackson, Private William Smith, Private Vincent Higgins, and the guy from Valley Stream, he's Private George Dahlbender. All the others from Limbrook, as I mentioned. Now, 
I want you to look at the part that's highlighted in light green right here. Those are the combat, combat dead. Most of them, as I mentioned, in the 20 days of the fiercest fighting against the Hindenburg Line. And they are Private William Goebel, Sergeant Harold Lathrop, Cook Frank Howard, Corporal Robert F. Garrison, Private Wilson J. Jackson, Private William A. Smith, Private Vincent Higgins, Private Sylvester Lamantia, and Sergeant Timothy John Crowley. In blue, you see the seven men who died, not of combat, but of the influenza epidemic that broke out in 1918. So these are the guys in blue, and one down here. They are Private George A. Dahlbender. He's the fellow from uh, Valley Stream. Private Chauncey Soper. He's the guy who stole the car. Private Anthony Ray. Private Clarence A. Ferris. Sergeant Freddie Wanders. Corporal Frank S. Wedlake. Sergeant First Class Charles F. Cheshire. We also have Lieutenant Farron. Where is he, Farron? Farron, right here. Philip Farron. Died of the influenza. Uh, no, I, I got that wrong. I'm sorry. I got the wrong guy. Um, the Army Corps, where's Philip? Oh yeah, Farron, he's the yeah, plane crash. Army Air Corps, we had that budding uh, biplane corps and they were in, he was in training in Texas and crashed a plane and died. And uh, also there's one more, I guess so. Oh yes, Lieutenant Commander Robert Allen Torres. He was a surgeon with the US Navy and he died at a British Naval Hospital in Chatham, England. We don't know the cause but it likely was the flu, dying probably from the very disease that he was treating. Okay, part three. I've just, let's see, this is, yep, stories of Limbrick and World War I. I've just told you about the men from Limbrick and vicinity who perished in World War I. Now I want to tell you about some of the men and women who went overseas and came back to Limbrook as war heroes. And I also want to tell you about the many others who supported the war from home. This is the five corners in 19, around 1910. Don't know the exact date of this, but pretty close. I want you to keep your eye on Bodies Hotel. That's the yellow building to the left, okay? Because that's where the Regal Theater is today, exactly there. That's what it looks like today. And for comparison, I'm going to show you the two photos side by side. Okay, we're looking at Merrick Road towards Rockville Center. You see? They're almost, yeah, almost the duplicate. The road is the same and nothing else. I suppose this is what you would call progress. I guess. I don't know. Horses and buggies line the streets. Oops, wrong button. This is Atlantic Avenue. We're looking up north towards Bodies Hotel right there. So looking up north, up uh, Atlantic Avenue, towards the Five Corners. It was a country village, maybe 3,000 people here. That's about all. I want to tell you now an amazing World War I short story. It's about Harry Thridgould. Here's Harry. Corporal Harry Threadgold, 1880 to about 1950. Don't know exactly when he died. And he was with His Majesty's Bantam Battalion. This, of course, is the Rockville Cemetery, Limbrook's. It's entirely within the village of Limbrook at the corner of Merrick and Ocean. There is as much history per square foot in this small cemetery as there is in any cemetery on Long Island. In fact, it's on the National Register of Historic Places. I wrote a book about the 139 shipwreck victims that are buried in the obelisk that you see here. That's this book that some of you have. Now, Harry Thridgall lived and worked in different places on Long Island as a uh, bartender. He called himself a mixologist. But it's th this is where Corporal Harry Threadgold, a World War I British Tommy, Tommy, said he wanted to be buried here in Limbrook. He had an affection for this place. Now, he was born in England, 
But in his 20s, he emigrated to Long Island, working also as a carpenter, but mostly as a, quote, mixologist. And when war broke out in Britain, in, in France, actually, and Britain joined the war, uh, there was a lot of propaganda, a drumbeat of propaganda. This poster shows St. George the dragon, uh, St. George attacking the dragon, the German dragon, of course, in this case. Uh, they had signs like this. This is Lord Kitchener. Britons want you. Join your country's army. And uh, we would later see a sign like that when the Americans adopted the same sign to get U.S. guys to, to join the army three years later. Now, although Harry Thridgold felt that Long Island was now his home, he sailed back to England to join the army. He was 34 years old. As you can see from this photo, Harry was a head shorter than a man of average height. When Harry showed up at a London recruiting office, he learned that the height cutoff was five feet, three inches. He was rejected. He was too short. Now, Harry and another short man became so upset. I mean, he traveled across the United States and war across the Atlantic in wartime at being rejected for being too short. He and the other man challenged all the men in the recruiting office to a fight. In fact, the attack, they attacked a couple of people who were the nearest men to them, and they couldn't get pulled off except by eight men to pull them off. Now, recognizing the value of men like this, the potential value, the recruiting office informed others, informed others, and they soon found a way to include short men into the British Army. They formed the Bantam Battalion. This is not kidding, folks. This is real. This is real. You'll find out how real this was in a moment. The cutoff was set at 4 feet 10. Harry showed up. He was too short. He was four feet, nine inches tall. What to do? We don't know what he did, but he either put on some boots, lifters in his shoes, I don't know what, but he got in and became officially the shortest man to serve in the entire World War I on either side. Officially the shortest man. Now, I'm telling you, the Bantam Battalion was not fooling. It was at one point, he, he fought for four years in the trenches. One day, Harry was knocked unconscious by an artillery shell exploding nearby. He awoke to find a dead comrade on one side and a seriously wounded guy again leaning against him on the, on the other side. After the war, though, Harry returned to Long Island and resumed work as a mixologist. Now, his heirs donated his, whoop, that's Harry, donated his tiny swords, a sword and scabbard, to the uh, Historical Society of uh, East Rockaway and Limbrook. And I put some of the memorabilia that he also left in some of his photos. That's a tiny little sword and scabbard. The Pearsall Brigade, Limbrook's Pearsall Brigade, again a photo by Leo Bach, the great photographer. I want to tell you about them. By 1917, the war in Europe had settled into an absolutely deadly stalemate of trench warfare. There were horrific stories being sent around the U.S. about the Germans raping, murdering Belgian civilians in particular. Most of these stories were completely fabricated. President Wilson wanted the U.S. to get into the war. He was what you call a Francophile and an Anglophile. He loved Britain. He loved France. He wanted us in. <clears throat> so to buttress his case, he allowed American ships, cargo ships, bring supplies to Britain to sail in waters that the Germans had declared restricted waters. Some of those ships were predictably sunk. Wilson asked Congress to declare war on Germany, and it did on April 6, 2017. Now, Limbrook had already been preparing for months. You've heard of Teddy Roosevelt and his Rough Riders. It's shown here around 1898 when they fought 
in the Spanish-American War, where they became heroes. Here is the Pearsall Brigade. The Pearsall Brigade led by Captain Philip Stoderman. Yep, that's the name that the avenue got, was named after him. And Mayor George W. Wright, he's on, on the right. As soon as rumors began to spread that the U.S. might enter the war, the Pearsall Brigade formed. And of course, Pearsall is the former name of Limbrook. It was led primarily by men in their 50s, men with experience in the uh, Spanish-American War. Now, this brigade served as a training unit to prepare younger men from Limbrook, East Rockaway, and Valley Stream to enter the U.S. Army should war be declared, to get them ready. Now, this is a photo of a mix of those older and younger men. I haven't been able to figure out what street it is. Someday I will. Um, note that the rifles are for drill purposes only. Those are wooden rifles. You can see it on the front ones, particularly. There's not even a trigger on them. Now, in this photo, but I, I should say, you may laugh at them using wooden rifles, but things got serious, and they got serious real fast once war was declared. Now, in this photo, you'll see what I mean. We have the Reverend Dominic Cassetta. Of, he's a priest of the Christ Church Episcopal. He's giving a benediction to the first group of recruits in World War I. Let's to get a close-up of this because despite their training with the Pearsall Brigade, the worry that you can see in their faces uh, is just absolutely palpable. They'd heard about the trench mortars, the gas attacks in Europe. Now, the next three photos, and we're about to get Tom Michio into the scene here, because they're all by Leo Bach, these photos. They show the first units recruited from Limbrook, East Rockaway, and Valley Stream after they've been formed up, after they've been given the uniforms, and they're getting ready to be shipped out. Uh, you'll see that some of the guys look too young to even be in high school. Here's the first of the three photos. Look at that young guy on the right. That's just amazing. He looks like he's in ninth grade. And this is the last one. Okay, now I'd like to invite Tom up to the front, and uh, if someone could get the lights. Well, Art, thank you. And Ma uh, Madeline Pearson, thank you again for the invite. I, I really appreciate this. The First World War, as Art indicated, it's the event that probably shaped our world more than anything else of the 20th century. Think of it this way, the Second World War, the rise of communism, and the modern Middle East all spring from what happened during the First World War. And as Art indicated, it started in 1914, and by the time the United States got involved in the war, the death toll had been absolutely horrific. In fact, as Art was talking, I'm reminded of the fact that in, on July 1st, 1916, the British inaugurated the uh, first part of what's, what became known as the Battle of the Somme. In that attack, on the first day, more people, more troops were killed, British troops were killed, than the entire population of Lindbrook. Imagine that. All of Lindbrook killed in one day. That's the kind of horrific uh, battle carnage that the, uh, that the Allies and the Germans, the Germans also had horrific attacks uh, had during the, the period from 1914 through 19, really through the entire war. What I'm doing tonight is I have, um, I, over the years, I was able to acquire some of the equipment that, uh, that would have been worn during the First World War. I am a bit of an amateur historian, not quite as good as art, but I've picked it up over the years, and uh, I'm going to give you a brief indication of what I'm wearing what the equipment is and what it and what the purpose of it is. Well, let's start with the Spanish-American War of 1898. After the Spanish-American War of 1898 and the following Philippine insurrection, which lasted until about 1902, the army realized that their uniforms, their field equipment, and even their service weapons, their rifles, were just inadequate compared to other the European powers and other countries. So they decided it's time we need to upgrade everything and be prepared 
if we ever go to another war. So what they did was they started to do some field testing and research, and it was rather tough for the Army in those days because there wasn't a lot of defense spending like you see today. It, was very, it wasn't a big priority. And any, any uh, military spending that was done in that era went to the Navy. The Na America was building a battle fleet and maintaining the fleet, and the fleet was considered America's first line of defense. After all, we have this huge Atlantic Ocean on one side, this huge Pacific Ocean on the other side. Mexico is a pretty weak country, so not really much of a threat to us. And we're, we have pretty good relations with Canada. So the thought was we really didn't need a big army. In fact, the army at that time was about 80 to 100,000 men, not very big at all. It was primarily engineers, coastal artillery. You see some of that around New York Harbor, some of the Fort Hamilton, um, uh, Fort uh, Shiloh across in Staten Island, and what used to be Fort Lafayette, which is now the base of the Veranzano Narrows Bridge. There used to be a fort there. Uh, so it was coastal artillery, and there were still some troops out in the west coast, out in the west, basically making sure that the, um, the Native Americans were re remaining on the reservation. So it was, the Army was really not a, um, uh, a very vibrant type force. It was kind of very quiet and staid. So they decided that the uniforms and equipment were just inadequate. They went ahead and did a lot of research. They compared what they had to what the Europeans had. And the first thing they came up with was a new uniform. What I'm wearing tonight is the enlisted man's uniform of 1912. And what they did was they realized that the days of wearing navy blue uh, uniforms like you did from the time of George Washington through all of our wars, those days were now over. The reason we no longer took soldiers and marched them shoulder to shoulder in regimental formation out into a field and then fired volley fire into the enemy and the enemy doing the same thing. The weapons and tactics had advanced to such a degree that that kind of warfare was just completely obsolete and it would have been suicide. So rather than have our men out in blue, blue uniforms that could be easily observed by the enemy at distance, the idea was to put them in uniforms that would blend into the background. Kind of be, you want to be inconspicuous as possible. Other countries, the British, the Germans, um, uh, this, even other Russians, they all adopted the same thing. The only country that really didn't do that by the time of the First World War was the French. They actually sent, at the very beginning, they sent their men out in blue, blue jackets with red pants, and they were, they were chopped to pieces because the enemy could see them at great distance. So they adopted this uniform, uh, as, uh, it's made out of very coarse wool. Under my, sh under my tunic, I'm wearing a three-piece wool, a three-button wool shirt. I have a coarse wool uh, trousers, a tunic, and, and you, probably the most thing that people, uh, when they see a World War I uniform, the thing they recognize the most are the, uh, what's called putties. These are the uh, leggings. I don't know if you can see this that well, but uh, these are called putties. These are leg wraps that were designed to, um, they were designed to keep stones, mud, twigs, all the kinds of debris out of your shoes or out of your boots. Originally, the United States Army, and you may have, and I noticed it in the, uh, in the uh, photographs, the Army originally used canvas leggings to do that, but they realized you're in a trench environment. You're going to be in the trench on a normal rotation for about 10 days. That's how they rotated the battalions in and out. So if you're in a trench, you're about there for about 10 days. Your feet are constantly going to be wet. So rather than have those wet leggings, uh, canvas leggings on, they came up with coarse wool because it dries. So it's a kind of a difficult thing to wrap these. Uh, it took me, uh, I hadn't worn this in a long time, but thank God for YouTube. I finally, I found a guy, some British guy on YouTube, and after watching it three or four times, I kind of got the hang of it, even though I, I didn't really do that good a job, but it kind of gives you an idea of what it's all about. So again, it's a heavy, coarse wool uniform. I happen to, um, as Madeline indicated uh, 
earlier, I happened to walk in the uh, March in the Parade in New York City on Sunday, and it was kind of a breezy, cold day, but even with this thing on, I was warm as toast. So it really accomplished um, what, it wa what you wanted it to do, which is to keep the troops warm in some of the harsh environment. Next I have, I'd like to show you the, I have the cartridge belt. This is a, uh, it's called the 1910 Mills belt. It was, that was the manufacturer. It is a, it is a 10 pocket belt. You open up the pocket and in here you would have two what are called stripper clips. These are two, these are um, pieces of metal with five rounds attached. And I'll show that when I show you the, the rifle in a few moments, how that would work. So you would have two of those or 10 rounds in each one of these, um, each one of these, uh, each one of these pockets. So you would have 100 rounds in the belt. If you were going on a, a prolonged offensive and you needed to carry more ammunition, you would probably be issued bandoliers, which would have the stripper clips in a cloth uh, binding that would wrap around your, around your chest. So normal load would be 100. Uh, uh, if you were in an advance, you probably would wear, have the bandoliers with more. Now, in, on, on my back, I'm going to, uh, sorry for the uh, turning my back on everybody, I have the 19, um, a 1910 field pack. Now, this is a, um, I have it deliberately um, un unfold to give you an idea how far down it could go. This was the pack that a soldier would normally carry all of his, all of his, the rest of his kit, if you will. He would have uh, a, a spare underwear, if he could get it, spare socks, uh, a shaving kit, and it was extremely important to be clean shaven in the First World War, and I'll get into that in a moment. And basically other um, accoutrements that you would carry. Uh, again, when you have, talk about clean socks and underwear, when they were in the trench for that 10-day rotation, a lot of times they really didn't even have a chance to, to, get, to take the uniform off. They would be living in this for literally 10 days straight, eat, sleep, and everything else in this uniform. So it was, it, the conditions were pretty terrible. So, so now we've talked about the cartridge belt and the field equipment in the back, the, the, the haversack. You might also see the shovel back there. It's actually called an entrenching tool. So it's a short shovel that if you, if, that if you needed to dig in, you could take your uh, entrenching tool out and dig, dig in to get cover, because there's no cover out there. By the, by, the time, uh, by the time you get into the trench area, the no man's land between our trench and the enemy trench has been completely pulverized, and there's no, there are no trees, maybe some, maybe some stumps. There's really nothing there. All the buildings have been destroyed. And interestingly enough, the trenches are not that far apart. You would think that they're maybe a mile or two apart. They're not. In many cases, the trenches are less than 250 yards apart. In some cases, less than 100. You could actually hear the guys in the other trench at night if they're talking. So the trenches are, um, they're a terrible place to be, and it's constantly wet. It's really horrendous. You're sleeping below grade in dugouts. You've got, you've got mice, you've got rats, you've got guys are infested with fleas. It's just a terrible, terrible conditions. So we've now looked at, uh, we've looked at the haversack, the entrenching tool. At the very top here is a little pouch. That's where I would have put my mess kit if I had one. Over here, I have my canteen cover, where my canteen would go. On this belt here, I have my bayonet, which is the appropriate bayonet for this rifle, which I'll be showing you in a moment. And uh, two more things that I think come to mind uh, that really are key pieces of equipment. The first is what I have on my head. This is the uh, metal, it's, it's the American version of what was called the British Brody helmet. If you think about the Revolutionary War, the, um, the Civil War. If you know, think about it, none of those guys had metal helmets on. Helmets had pretty much dis disappeared from the battlefield for about 300 years prior to the First World War. So why did helmets come back? Well, initially they didn't. Uh, soldiers on both the German side and the British and French side went into the first battles without helmets. They would normally wear just campaign hats. 
But what happened as they got into trench warfare, again, it's the advance of technology for military applications that forced it because both sides, artillery, developed what was called a proximity fuse, meaning you could fire a shell at the enemy trench, it could hit the ground and explode, or it could go up and maybe 100 feet or so in above the trench, it would explode. Think of it as a gigantic shotgun. So you would have shards of metal just spread all over the place. And if you got hit in the head with that, that was pretty much it. So what armies decided to do was issue um, helmets, steel helmets, to protect their men from the artillery. The American helmet that I'm wearing, again, it's a copy of the British. This was a very, very simple design. In fact, it, Art will really appreciate this. This design was so simple that if you look at tapestries of Joan of Arc defeating the, the, the English invaders in the 14th century during the Hundred Years' War, the British or the English soldiers are depicted wearing essentially the same helmet. They didn't, the British didn't know how to, how to come up with a helmet that quickly. They saw that and they came back with this. It's actually not a very good design because it doesn't offer a lot of protection to the side of the head. The Germans came up with the, what's called the Stahlheim, which is the German helmet that we see in the movies from the First and Second World War. It was actually a much better design. In fact, the, when the uh, Allies got some of them, captured them, or took them off the battlefield, they didn't even know how the Germans had been able to make it because they, were, they thought the metallurgy was a little uh, strange. So the Germans actually had better equipment when it came to head protection. The last piece that I'm wearing that I want to talk about tonight, and Art, if you would be so kind as to just to hold this, is the gas mask. I have this in front of me, and I can either wear it over, around my neck, or I could wear it, I could expand this belt and put it around my side. Most men actually kept it in front of them. This is an extremely vital piece of equipment. You didn't go anywhere on, in the trench without this gas mask. The reason... You never know when the enemy is about to launch an attack. And so what would happen is you'd have this uh, with you at all times. Then if someone detected gas, they would scream out, gas, gas, gas. And what would happen is this. The first thing I'm going to, for ease of uh, illustration, I'm going to take these off. You would peel off your helmet right away, drop it, open up your gas mask bag, And, of course, by the time I get mine out, I'm already got dead. <laughs> you would pull out this. This is the British, uh, ver the, latest, the latest version of the British gas mask from the First World War. It's called the Improved Mask. This is what our troops were issued. So if that's the first sign of gas, you have to take this, And make sure, I don't know if you can hear me, make sure that you had this on. And if you, if you heard me earlier, in fact, I'm going to take it off just so you can hear me. <laughs> you heard me earl say earlier that you had to be clean shaven. The reason you have, you have to be clean shaven, and the Army has been so strict about that over the years, is you had to make sure that your mask fit properly. You could not have any gaps in the mask because that's where the, ga the gas being so insidious, it, would, it could actually seep within, the, um, within the, the openings of a mask. And once you got that stuff in your lungs, you were in very, very bad shape. You either were killed. Many men were scarred for life because they breathed that stuff in. It would, it would burn their lungs out. Many men were, um, were blinded by gas. In fact, I was speaking to a gentleman earlier that um, said that he knew of someone that died really of gas, of the effects of poison gas in the 1930s. Many of the men that uh, were gassed during the war, their lifespans were cut short dramatically because of the effects of gas. So that's why you have to be clean shaven and make sure you have your, your shaving kit. So now, the last piece of equipment, because I know time is short, 
We're going to show you the business end. And Art, if you would hold this, please. Now, this is the business end. This is why the, the infantryman is out there. Now, the first rule of firearms safety is a uh, firearms is safety, safety, safety. So now, I know I've checked this rifle before I came, but to make sure everyone is uh, comfortable, I'm going to open it up. And Art, if you would just take a quick look, you'll see that there is nothing in the nothing in the internal magazine and nothing in what's called the receiver. Okay? Just so don't, we know, don't point it at me. That's right. <laughs> so we know this. So this, we know this weapon is safe. It's basically a 10-pound paperweight at this point. I'm putting the safety on, pull the trigger all day, nothing will happen. This is, in fact, I have a quick quiz. And, I, and there's one gentleman I spoke to earlier. Can anybody identify this rifle? Anyone that knows what this is? Uh, I think you're thinking of the 1903 Springfield. Yeah, this is not. This is the model 1917 rifle. This rifle was originally designed by the British. It was a British, they were experimenting with a new rifle. And by the time the war came, you can't be doing any experimenting when you need weapons. The British found out that they were, uh, they were grossly inadequate supply of, of rifles for their infantry. So, and they couldn't, compi they couldn't uh, manufacture anymore. They, they were at full capacity. So they had this design. They turned to America. They went to Remington and uh, Winchester, the, the great rifle companies of the day, and said, can you manufacture this weapon in British 303 caliber for our army? And sure enough, Winchester and Remington were very more than happy to take the contract and in a little over two years, they manufactured over a million of these for the British Army. Just as the contract ran out at the, at the, uh, the beginning of 1917, the United States gets into the war. And this, we have the same problem. We have about, depending on who you read, we have about 400,000 1903 Springfield rifle, our basic rifle, in, uh, in inventory. The, uh, the army is talking about raising an army of two to four million men. So we have a tremendous shortage of weapons. So the army goes to, Spring, um, to uh, Remington and Winchester and says, well, you've been making rifles for the British. Can you turn around and make that into American 30 6 caliber, which has been the standard caliber for, uh, since 1906? That's where the 30 6 come from. So they said, can you make these for us? And, of course, Remington and, and Winchester are more than happy to oblige. They were getting about $30 a piece for these back in 1917. A lot of money then. So let me give you a little bit of a, a brief idea of what this can do. This particular one is made by the Winchester Rifle Company in, um, in Connecticut. It was manufactured in March of 1918. It, is, it was pretty much the weapon that America went to war with. If you were drafted or volunteered for the Army, two-thirds to three-quarters of the American Army went to war with this rifle. In fact, the famous Sergeant York, you may have heard of, he, he was issued one of these. And the, uh, the, I know the 27th Infantry Division, which was where uh, both Lathrop and um, Howard were um, part of the 27th Infantry Division, they were originally issued these as well. Most troops carried this. This is an extremely robust uh, weapon in its internal magazine. You take what I mentioned earlier, a five round clip, stripper clip out of your cartridge belt. It has a little bit of a groove in here. You take that, you push, the, you push that clip in with the five rounds, you push it in with your thumb. Now this, because it's empty, I have to manually push the, what's called the follower uh, closed. You push that forward, and you're ready to fire. Now, to operate this weapon, unlike the rifles of today, you need to um, manually work the bolt every time you fire. So you fire like that until you get to the fifth round, and then you have to open the bolt all the way, take another stripper clip out, and load it. This was a extremely, uh, as I said, this was an extremely robust weapon. Well, um, well manufactured. It saw service in, um, in World War I. It was eventually uh, put back into inventory. A lot of these were given, in, later on, a lot of these were given to the Philippines 
So the Philippine army that eventually, that was under the command of um, General MacArthur later in, during World War II, they were armed with these, other countries were armed with these, and they still find these every now and then in Syria, believe it or not, because they've been floating all over the place over the last hundred years. So that's a, that's a pretty quick uh, g g an idea of what the average American doughboy was equipped with. Now the origin of the name doughboy, um, that name, there's a lot of different theories how that happened. Some people believe that goes all the way back to the 19th century. Some people think it, had, it came out of the Philippines because they used to, when these guys would come in from uh, being out in the field, they were covered with dust. There's all different kinds of theories on that. But this gives you a basic understanding of what the average American uh, GI, or actually doughboy at the time, they weren't called GIs, what the average doughboy would have carried, especially those that came from the Lindbrook East Rockaway Valley Stream area. So thanks. Wow, that was fabulous. <laughs> ah, thank you so much. Yeah, round of applause. That was fabulous. He was a last minute addition. Boy, am I glad I brought him in. Just great. Yeah, make a gas mask. <laughs> okay, now, part four. Limbrick women in World War I. Uh, they were very actively involved in our war effort. Very active. Uh, I have some great pictures from uh, Leo Bach. The women were not often the subject of serious interest for writers, for photographers in World War I. Um, but Leo H. Bach, he was there. He was a guy with extraordinary skill and, I would say, sensitivity to what women were doing. And he thought they deserved his camera's attention. While the men of Limbrook were drilling with their wooden rifles, getting ready for war, uh, the women of Limbrook also went to work, and Leo Bach's camera recorded the action. These volunteers, you see here, are preparing the war census for draft age men in 1917. The next one will be the Dorcas Club. I'll bet no one's heard of the Dorcas Club. Very big back in the, the teens, 19 teens. They're preparing bed linens for the troops. You notice everyone has a hat. Even this lady here has a little funny little hat. But everybody's working with a hat. The Red Cross is up next. Women joined the Red Cross in huge numbers in Limbrook. Absolutely huge numbers. Three times the number as joined in World War II. Virtually, you know, almost all women around joined up. Here they're knitting socks and rolling bandages for the troops. Now this up next is one of my favorite Limbrook volunteers. And no, it's not Frida Halla, a Red Cross volunteer. It is her Scottish retriever, Caesar. Now when Frida solicited donations for bandages and for other supplies for the Red Cross, she always went with Caesar, she brought him along. In the summer of 1917, Caesar headed off on his own down Hempstead Avenue. It was the 4th of July, and he kind of joined in with the parade. He had that collection box held in his teeth with this, you see this wire going there? Held in his teeth by the handle. When Caesar returned home to Frida, she was up there where I live, up near the little five corners. Uh, he had collected $33.50. This was the largest total collected by any man, woman, boy or girl in a single day during World War I. His grand total at the end of the war, $445. Exceeded anybody's total. Caesar was buried with honors in Limbrook in 1922 at age 12. There he is, a World War I hero, Caesar the dog. Now the French government was so appreciative of the extraordinary efforts that were coming from Limbrook, they could see what we were doing out here, that they sent their ambassador 
out to the village with uh, some uh, sailors from the Amiral Aubé, uh, a French cruiser. It's not Admiral, it's Amiral, which it says there in the bottom. Um, they had a second, well, they wanted, first they wanted to express their thanks to Limbrook, but they had another really good reason for coming out to Limbrook. This fellow, Henri Charpentier. He was the proprietor of one of the finest French restaurants in the world. Absolutely famous worldwide. Now my next uh, local hero, in fact not just local because she really was a genuine hero in the war, in, at the front, almost the front, Rusha Williams of the U.S. Army, a genuine hero and a resident of Limbrook for 50 years. Her story is my favorite of all the stories that I know of from World War I. She's not only a true American patriot, she is a war hero. She is proof also that love can thrive and survive in something as horrible as World War I. In 1917, Rusha was an Alabama native who had just moved to California and was working as a registered nurse. She was unmarried, living with her mom, up there in California. She was 32 years old. Today, we would think of her as, well, then rather, not today, we would not be called an old maid, but then she would be. Today, we have lots of girls getting married in the late 30s and 40s. But at 32, you could probably think, predict that she would end up that way. She herself could never have guessed what was going to happen to her. What a different life she would have and her love life that would soon arrive. And when the U.S. entered World War I, Rusha Williams was one of the very first volunteers in what's called the American Expeditionary Force, which is the Ar U.S. Army that was sent to Europe. One of the very first to join up in the nurse corps because she was, in fact, a registered nurse. This is her, the, that photo I have here came from her Army card, U.S. I ID card. So you see the American Expeditionary Forces up there. And here she is in her army uniform. Now, Rusha's initial assignment before being sent overseas was to Camp Wordsworth in South Carolina for basic training. For a nurse, this meant preparing to deal with the horrific wounds that she would see from artillery bursts, the kind of thing that Tom was talking about, those shell, uh, I guess they're like shotgun shells coming down at you from above, uh, devastating injuries machine gun wounds, poison gas. And it was at that camp, Camp Wordsworth, that she met a dashing lieutenant, Harley Cooper, from Lindbrook. Harley was training men for the 60th Infantry to prepare for action in Europe. He also had to train nurses because they had to be able to deal with hostile action. French hospitals had already been hit with shells inadvertent, it wasn't on purpose that the Germans did it, but it happened. So nurses had to be trained, for example, for emergency ev evacuation, uh, things of that sort, for wounded men. But it was at that camp that she met Harley and fell in love. But they were soon separated. Rusha was the first of the two to be sent overseas. And this was what she sent back. When she arrived, the one and only telegram she could send was not to her mom. <laughs> it was to Harley. And it said, arrived, love Williams. Um, it couldn't even say where she was because that was censored out. No location. Now her first assignment was in France at a hospital in Mars Sous Ali in France. Now I said hospital, but it was a hotel converted into wards. You can even see this crack that runs down the floor. You can see the wood has boarded up the windows in case an artillery burst should hit nearby. Uh, that's the kind of place that they had. There was really no hospital. In her first three weeks, in the, ho the hospital admitted a staggering number of wounded and sick. 252 French, 358 Americans in the first three weeks. 
In the seven months that she was there until the armistice, her unit handled 8,000 surgical cases and 7,500 other medical cases, many of them involving the deadly influenza. Now, by the end of the war, Mar Suzeli, the town she was in, 20 hotels, inns, and homes were converted into hospital wards. Three months after Russia reached France, Lieutenant Harley Cooper arrived with the 60th uh, Infantry Regiment. Well, she's in the midst of all of her hospital work. He was under the command of, overall command of General Blackjack Pershing, and Harley's objective was the 100 Days Offensive with a lot of the other guys. He was not in the same unit with the Limburg guys, but he was there. Love letters, no place for that at this time. You are not going to be passing that from one to the other, but they each did know where they were. When the offensive began in September, sick and wounded arrived so fast in Marsuzali that all 20 hotel hospitals, houses, whatever you want to call them, were full. Incoming trains had to be held on sidings, and the nurses treated soldiers in the railroad cars. Rusha must have wondered if she'd see Harley on one of those stretchers that are on, on, the, tr on the trains. And of course, half of the arrivals were suffering from that deadly, deadly flu. It could affect her. It killed nurses, too. That Helen Ficken you saw before from Hempstead, among the 11, the first 11, she died of the flu. In fact, virtually all of the deaths among the nurses, 134 of them, most of them were from the flu that they caught from their patients. At this terrible time, terrible time for the two of them, both Harley and Rusha had tremendous cause for concern. Tremendous for themselves and for each other. And suddenly, on November 11, 1911, at 11 a.m., the war ended with the armistice. But the armistice did not end the war for Harley or for Russia. For Harley, there were bodies to bury, prisoners of war to process, displaced civilians to feed, house. For Russia, there were still hundreds of sick and wounded still arriving and to be cared for. It took five months from the time of the armistice for the two of them to finally get together. And we have a picture, incredibly, of the two of them on the day they met each other. Harley and Rusha meet in mars sur France, and note Rusha's army issue boots that she has on. The affection of the two, I maintain, I feel it, I can see it in the photo. It seems to me that Rusha is so, I guess, overwhelmed by seeing Harley that she can't even look at the camera. I wonder if you feel that way. The next photo is a not, lot nicer situation. You'll see how this all came out. This is their wedding photo on their wedding day in Limbrook in 1921. They were married in Limbrook's Christ Episcopal Church by none other than Harley's brother, John V. Cooper. He was the rector of the Episcopal Church. That same year, Harley and Rusha joined Limbrook's American Legion post. She had every right to. She was a veteran, a member of the U.S. Army. Not only that, she was a sole woman member and became an officer of the American Legion. Now, Harley died in 1964, but Rusha's limber connection stayed as strong as ever. She married a family friend. His name was Paul E. Holm of Limbrook. Now, I know that name well, but you probably don't. But he is the <laughs> composer and librettist of Limbrook's official song, Limbrook, USA. Isn't that a nice, beautiful tie-in? And Rusha Williams Cooper Holm, a hero of World War I, died in Limbrook at the age of 85. What a wonderful story, huh? Fabulous. I challenge anybody around in a village of Nassau County to come up with a better one. I don't think they will. Part five, 
And this is our last part, the Doughboy Monument. I want to close this presentation with the discussion of Limbrook's magnificent Doughboy Monument. It was dedicated uh, back in 1921, so three years after the war ended, by General John E. Ryan. And I have a photo of the parade as it passed through the Five Corners on the day of the dedication. And here it is. It's at the Five Corners. There's a bank here. There's a puppy palace or whatever over here. So the we're near where the theater would entrance to the theater would be with this view. That's General Ryan right there. So they're about to dedicate the monument. <coughs> now our monument uh, has received some great recognition just this year, 2018. The US World War I Centennial Commission and the Pritzker Military Museum and Library have said that our monument is one of only 50 World War I memorials around the entire country to be honored this, this year with the official national designation as a World War I Centennial Memorial. And that's largely because of the beautiful setting that it has down there by the train station, the attractiveness of the monument, and the way that Limbra cares for it. And this is how it looked on Memorial Day. I took this picture. And you can see it's just absolutely gorgeous. In my research for tonight's presentation, I examined various sources, military records, etc., in an attempt to learn more about the men and women, and particularly the men, who made the supreme sacrifice and their names are on our monument. The 15 names. And this was one of my sources. Just a moment. There it is. The Roll of Honor. Let me read the title page to you because it's a little hard to see. Citizens of the state of New York who died in the service of the United States during the World War. Compiled by Brig Brigadier General J. Leslie Kincaid the Adjutant General of the State. Now all 15 of the names that, I that were on the monument, I found them in here and found their street addresses and things like that and how they died, where they died. That's how I got that, a lot of my information from that big chart I showed you before. But looking further, because I wasn't just satisfied to look for those 15, I wanted to see, gee, could there be anybody else from Lindbrook? My, my computer had it very easy search term that I could put in for Lindbrook in from this. And let's take a look at two of the pages that I found. And I've got to tell you, when I saw the first page, page 92, I received what I think is the biggest shock I've received in my decades, three decades of doing research on Lindbrook. Absolute shock. This is a bit blurry. So it's a digitally scanned page that I, I got on the internet. I'm going to read the lines of the, that I highlighted with the red arrow. So right there, there are two names. The first, Cheshire, Charles F., Limbrook, New York, Sergeant First Class, Troop E, 15 Cav, died of lumbar pneumonia and epimia, March 2, 1918. Sadly, Sergeant First Class Charles Cheshire of Lindbrook is not listed on the Doughboy Monument. Two lines down we have Crowley, Timothy John, 5 Washington Street, Lindbrook, New York. Sergeant, Company C, 306th Infantry, died of wounds, August 20, 1918. This is just as the 100 days war uh, um, battle is just beginning. Sergeant Timothy Crowley of Lindbrook is not listed on our monument. There's one more name, page 96. The hair was standing up on the back of my neck when I'm reading this stuff. I cannot believe it. Torrance Robert Allen, 49 Jarvis Place, Lieutenant Commander, died February 24, 1921 at the British Naval Hospital, Chatham, England. There's no cause of death listed. Lieutenant Commander Robert Torrance of Limbrook was a surgeon in the US Navy. I found, did some f further research about him. And he served on this ship 
the USS Chattanooga. It had never had been in actual battle. It was an escort bringing troops across, and uh, he being a surgeon, he likely died of the deadly influenza, the very disease that he would have been treating and the sailors as they came across. A lot of sailors died of the disease too. Mr. Torrance, Lieutenant Commander Torrance, was left off the Doughboy Monument, his name forgotten. It's ironic that on the front of our Doughboy Monument is the inscription. I think I have it here. What's the first line? Can anybody see that? Lest we forget. As proud as I am about the role of Limerick's men and women in World War I, and I am incredibly proud, I'm indeed shocked. These omissions are unforgivable. How could this happen? Let's look again at the Roll of Honor that came out one year after our monument was dedicated. Okay? But this is a terrible excuse. What kind of an excuse? After all, the monument was destroyed by a motorist when it was over on Blake Avenue and Merrick Road. I think the base might have been okay, but the, the doughboy himself was smashed to pieces. No one saw the Roll of Honor? No one even thought to see, or is there another name to add? Terrible, terrible excuse to say, oh, we went by the the day that uh, it was dedicated, that's all we knew. It's just not right. Now, this is not the first time in Limbrook. In researching my book, The History of Limbrook, I uncovered three policemen and a fireman who died in the line of duty in the 1930s and were forgotten. Totally forgotten. I've since had their names added to memor memorials in Limbrook, in Albany, and Washington, D.C. I was a little bit tougher finding that because I had to go to newspapers of the day to get those policemen and firemen. But this was here on the Roll of Honor. So I think we must do as much for these men. These three men must be added to the monument. There's room, okay? So I hate to end on a sour note of them not being there, but let's make this a positive thing here that the folks in Limbrook TV are recording this, and let's get the VFW, let's get the City Fathers, let's get them together, let's get the American Legion on this, and let's get those names, those three names, on the monument by the time we have the next Veterans Day or Memorial Day, they should be carved onto that monument. So thank you, I'm at the end of my presentation, and uh, I'm glad, you didn't ask many questions earlier, but I want to have time now to, you can ask uh, Tom and me uh, anything you want, um, and we get the lights up. Uh, thank you very much for coming out. Question. You, you, you mentioned at the beginning of my presentation, I mentioned Germany and Russia. There was a, quite a bit of trench warfare, not as much. More dramatic, if you had asked me about Italy, I've done a presentation on World War I, the war in the Alps, the called the White War. That was very different completely also, but there was a lot of trench warfare between Italy and Austria. So that was scattered places, there were different ways that the battle were fought in the war. They called it, a Art's right, it was the war in the Alps. They actually called part of it the ice war. Some of the trenches were actually dug into the ice. So you had guys, in fact, there was something on television not long ago. The Italians on this giant mountain, it's, and it's still there today, the, the Italians dragged a, an eight inch gun. That's a gigantic gun. They dragged it up a mountain to pound the, to pound the Austrian positions. It took like 300 men two months to get this cannon to the top of this mountain. And, but when they got it there, they were able to uh, pound the Austrians, and the Austrians were forced to retreat. So there was some tremendous uh, fighting, all of, not just in the uh, Western Front, the Eastern Front, the Middle East, the Alps. Literally, it was a world war.
find uh, the role of honor? What I did was I was typing in names, and so I picked a, a good names, Chauncey Soper. I figured there could be a lot of Chauncey Sopers around, right? Garrison, other names were going to be good. That name was a hit because I got only one or two responses on the internet for that. And that led me to the role of honor. And once I saw that, oh boy, now I could find everybody in that book because it was organized by county of New York State. And so I could go into Nassau County and uh, look, for, look for all the names in Nassau County. And that's where I found these three guys. And this was online. Give you my contact information. You'll tell me what website it's on. Sure. Yeah. I'll give you my card. You let you I'll send a note to me. Right. Yeah. Are you going to do something about it? Uh, you mean before I said the names on the website? Yeah. Well, I, I think we should. You know, get oh, not you. Be, you're not in a position to influence the VFW or something like that. Okay, that's all right. Well, I'm the, I'm the Oh, you are? Okay, you remember member of the Legion. My but, uh... Yeah, yeah, talk to them. I'll send it to you and you'll see their names. And you can compare to the monument. I, I think it's a slam dunk. I can't, if there's room on the monument, I can't see why anybody would say no. I can't either. It, but, it but, will be done. No, but, but I, I want to share that document with the, Fine, absolutely. With the town historian of uh, Edinburgh, New York, who is working on... I have a vacation home in Saratoga County in the town of Edinburgh. And I've never I heard of it. With the town historian there is on a Civil War guy. And I'm doing Civil War research, but she's doing World War I research. I, I suspect she knows of the document. I would guess she does, but you can Maybe send it to her. Yeah. Okay, I guess that's it. Oh, uh, Steve. Is that a uh, summer outfit also? Uh, generally, no. They would wear these. Pretty much, they would wear these year-round. Now, they now with, during the summer, the in the in the hot uh, summers, they would take the tunic off. So they would basically, in fact, if you see the Doughboy monument there, as he's portrayed, he's not wearing the tunic. He's not. He's wearing the cartridge belt. He's not wearing the tunic, and he's not wearing the field gear that I am now. So generally, in the summertime, he would be. Um, he'd have the cartridge belt on over the uh, three three button shirt. He wouldn't be wearing, he's not wearing the tunic. Okay, but he does have the, the putties and, um, and uh, of course, the Brody helmet. I don't see a gas mask, but then again, it's a statue and you wouldn't normally have that. But, but if he was in the field, he would have the, the um, what you see there in the summer, plus his gas mask. The Doughboy statue is, I call him the peripatetic Doughboy. He's moved around. Here's a, I'm going the wrong way. Here he is at Blake Avenue. That's St. John's Church there, the former building that they had. So you see it at Merrick Road and Blake Avenue. There's the Doughboy sitting there. Then it was moved to the library. And then finally it was put to the wonderful spot that it is now, right down there by the train station. Thanks a lot, folks. <laughs>